together. You too can let us know that you're here today by participating in worship, responding with prayers and presents and gifts and service and your witness online, sharing it in your own social media. Today, as we gather on this Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, the last days toward Easter, I invite you to cross the threshold of your common lives into the beauty and the light of worship, to take a deep breath and be in this place, to let the Lord speak to you and through you and the Spirit to well up among you, so that as we sing and pray and the scripture is read and preached and we respond, that we do so from our most authentic places. And as we gather to worship in this special day, I'm going to invite you to worship body and mind and soul. So will you stand as you are able in body or spirit and join me now in the Palm Sunday procession? I need the slide. <laughs> Thank you. Hear the good news of how our Lord Jesus entered Jerusalem. Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Number 280, all glory, laud, and honor. Let us boldly sing together. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. 
in our prayer of confession. Holy and merciful God, who weeps, bleeds, cries, and waits for us, for us and, and because of us. us. We come before you to share our confessions and to invite you into our brokenness. Hear our cries for healing and restoration. We know that already you are a work among us, showing us the way to relieve from the toxicities and grief of our time. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. O oh God, our deliverer, you led your people of old through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Guide now the people of your church. Keep us steadfast in your word that we may walk through the wilderness of this world toward the glory of the world to come. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Listen now to God as God speaks to us through the appointed reading from Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord because he is good, because his faithful love lasts forever. Let Israel say it. God's faithful love lasts forever. Open the gates of the righteous for me, so that I can come through and give thanks to the Lord. This is the Lord's gate. Those who are righteous enter through it. I thank you because you answered me, because you were my saving help. The stone rejected by the builders is now the main foundation stone. This has happened because of the Lord. It is astonishing in our sight. This is the day the Lord acted, that we will rejoice and celebrate in it. Lord, please save us. Lord, please let us succeed. The one who enters in the Lord's name is blessed. We bless all of you from the Lord's house. The Lord is God. He has shined a light on us. So lead the festival offering with ropes all the way to the horns of the altar. You are my God. I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will lift you up high. Give thanks to the Lord because he is good. Because his faithful love lasts forever. Thus ends the first reading. Please be seated in the chancel for the children's moment. As the children come forward for the children's moment, congregation, will you join me in singing verse one of Tell Me the Story of Jesus? When someone sees us and notices we would like to not be touched at all, thank you very much, and just says, I see you. Our bodies let us know when they need something, like when we have really, really big feelings but we don't have all the words for them, or like when we need help with something that's frustrating. You know, at dinner time, when your parents are preparing the meal and you've got homework, but you have a question you don't know how to answer, 
Well, they don't know how to read your mind. They need you to tell them, hey, I need some help. And likewise, sometimes when things are going on in our bodies, in our thoughts, and in our feelings, we have to learn to ask for some help. Your church wants you to know there are people who can help with those things. So just imagine how much even more Jesus wants to help you with those things. Today, in a moment, when Mr. Kraus reads the gospel story, we're going to hear about a man named Bartimaeus. And I want you to listen for how he talks to Jesus and how Jesus talks back to him. When you hear the scripture read, that you can know that Jesus answers his question with need to ask him what does he want? How can Jesus help? On Palm Sunday, we usually wave the palm branches and then you guys sing us some beautiful music and we remember that Jesus' body walked down the Palm Sunday road and that people wanted to see him and that he could see them. I wonder what made it possible for the man on the side of the road who was blind to recognize Jesus. And I wonder how Jesus knew to ask him what he wanted help with. And I wonder what are some healthy ways that we can let people know when we need help. When something hurts or something's not right or we don't know the answer. I wonder what it feels like when people don't see you. <coughs> And what happens when you feel invisible when you're suffering? And I wonder, what can someone do to help you when you need to be seen? <coughs> Today, the scripture tells you about Jesus' body, and that reminds us that our bodies are good too, really special, and that we practice listening to them, and that God helps us in meeting their needs. Will you guys say a prayer with me? Let's close our eyes and take a deep breath. And hold our hands together and get real still. God, help us to see you with our eyes, and we pray that your eyes would see us. And that you would help us to not be invisible, but also to know when we have to ask for help. Thank you, Jesus, for helping people, for seeing what they cannot. It's in your holy name we pray, and all God's children said... Amen. If you're in the children's choir, would you stay up here? And if you're not, you're invited to come have a seat with your grown-ups.
I invite you now to stand as you are able for the appointed reading from the Gospel from Mark. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus and his followers came into Jericho. As Jesus was leaving Jericho together with his disciples and a sizable crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus' son, was sitting beside the road. When he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was there, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. Many scolded him, telling him to be quiet. But he shouted even louder, Son of David, show me mercy. Jesus stopped and said, Call him forward. They called the blind man. Be encouraged. Get up. He's calling you. Throwing his coat to the side, he jumped up and came to Jesus. Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, Teacher, I want to see. Jesus said, Go, your faith has healed you. At once he was able to see, and he began to follow Jesus on the way. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Just say, the Lord needs it. And we will send you back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. And as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor, David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. This perishable body has been our Lenten series, and today on the last Sunday of Lent, I invite you to explore with me one more time the connection between our bodies and our minds and our souls, our connection to one another as the body of Christ as we consider how the Palm Sunday Road is carried out by Jesus and the disciples and the crowds. And how that walk impacts our own lives and our own hearts and this community. That path was meant and still is for healing. So I invite you to find a way into healing together. It's a shared journey of faith. Will you pray with me? God of our lives, we journey through healing to search for your healing and your perfect love. Our bodies have known fasting, our souls have known wearied paths not of your choosing.
God of holiness, direct each step now. And turn our shouts of Hosanna toward Jesus because we recognize the gravity of his gift. Guide us, O Lord, in accepting your honor that we might serve you with every moment and breath of our lives. And so to lead us back to you and to this body which you call good. We pray in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Here in this gospel story, Jesus understands the personal touch required in his ministry. It's not just spiritual or emotional, but it is also physical. He turns to the man on the side of the road, and when he asks Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? He is extending healing to that particular person in that moment with their specific needs. And Jesus calls out to him, call him here. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up. He is calling you three times. The gospel writer says you have been called by Jesus. The story is not just about this man's physical healing, not just restoring his sight, but it is about hearing the call of Jesus, hearing his voice to us in our circumstances. And if we would have spiritual ears to hear, we might be surprised at the deep personal questions that Jesus is asking to us when he says, What do you want me to do for you? He is asking you, as we sit alongside Bartimaeus on the side of the road. It's really possible to hear lots of things calling out to you in our daily lives. Perhaps you hear all of the commercials that suggest if you just had more stuff, that it would be better. If you just did more activities, you would be fitter. More, 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 it shouts to us. But our call is, can we hear past all of the noise to discern the voice of God in Jesus Christ, who is concerned with your deepest desires? What do you want me to do for you, he asks. Can you hear the call, friends? Do you know that voice? If it wasn't me and 200 of my closest friends today here and online, I would say, if it was just me and Jesus, I would say, what do you, what do I want you to do for me, Jesus? I'm so glad you asked. I have been in the proverbial waiting line for my entire life waiting for this moment. I have jumped through every ecclesial hoop you have asked me to jump through. I have prayed and I have fasted and I have had communion and I have worshipped and I've been in Sunday school and Wednesday night and dinner. I've been on committees. I have even gotten ordained. I cannot wait for this particular moment. And I think I would start by saying, if it were today, Jesus, you know that I am the parent of two young adults. And in addition to them, I teach a young adult class and I love these people like I love them. A lot. But is it at all possible that you could maybe prevent them from getting into debt so deep that they can never crawl out? Because they are trying to buy a house and try to get a car and they're trying to pay for an education and they're trying to do all of these things and I'm terrified they're going to get buried. Jesus, would you keep that from happening? Or if he was standing in front of me, I would have to try to get brutally honest with myself and say, Hey, Lord, I've been playing the boundary game for a minute. You know that I work too much, and I also feel like I don't work enough because I can't get it all done, and the days aren't long enough, but my body cannot stand up to this, this pace. And if I was thinking about my future, I would say, um, what, do you, what do I want you to do for me? Uh, so there's a doctor's appointment I've been avoiding. <laughs> You know which one I'm talking about. I'd really like to maybe just skip the aging process altogether. Is that an option? (laughs) Asking Jesus for your deepest desires is not selfish. 
It's not self-indulgent to ask the Lord for yourself. In fact, today he invites you to answer the question, what do you want me to do for you? And when you answer that, it is self-preservation that you choose. And frankly, considering that God could take care of your needs over ourselves or somebody else is kind of, well, it's kind of an act of political warfare to trust in the one holy and mighty God to care for you. So for real, if Jesus was with you, as the scripture says today, and said to you, what do you want me to do for you? What's your answer? How do you answer that? Today's scripture gives you an invitation, an opportunity for understanding, because hearing the call of that personal question from God made flesh allows you to see who Jesus really is, to see him for who he is, because you're allowing him to see you for who you really are. You're more than just a body or a mind or a soul. You are all of these things made together beautifully and fearfully and wonderfully made. We have to search for what is most valuable to us, what is most important, to name that before God the things that we yearn for so deeply. As you sit on the side of the road with Bartimaeus, what are your deepest desires? What do you want me to do for you, he asks. Is it mend your broken family relationships? Maybe it's provide meaningful, lifelong work now that you're retired. Perhaps you just like a peace of mind. Not even the whole thing, just, no, you know what I mean, peace of mind. Maybe you would like the Lord to erase those anxieties and fears or be so bold as to say, what I really want from you is the courage to forgive the person who has hurt me and hurt me and hurt me. Maybe you just want to love again. I'm not the one asking you this morning. Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? And what the apostles say is, take heart, get up, he is calling you. The healing here on the side of the road with Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, is one of a number of healing miracles. When you read one of these miracle stories about Jesus, they follow a formula. There's certain kinds of language that happens where people cry out. Jesus says things back to them before he chooses to act, and then the healing takes place. Jesus' actions and words are often aimed at transforming a disabled body into an abled one, but somehow that feels too simple on the surface, as if it removes the integrity of whatever ability one's body has. Instead, today I invite you to focus not on the transformation of the body, but the transformation of the whole person, body, mind, and soul. Notice, notice that the mark of a disciple is one who is healed and then follows. In this case, Jesus is on his way from Jericho. He's in this great city, and he has to get to Jerusalem in time for what is to come, the Passover. And on his way along the side of the road, he travel, he, he's traveling with a group of people who are following him that he is teaching. And there is a man named Bartimaeus. He is blind, and he sits on the sideway of the road. Now, he is unable to see. And he is there begging for money. Bartimaeus represents the poorest of the poor, okay? He is outside the city. He is outside of the actual roadway and path. He is outside of the light and the ability to see. And he is entirely outside of the economy. Bartimaeus, like many whom Jesus will heal completely embodies being excluded 
from all of society. And although it says that he is the son of Timaeus, he is a man without a household. He is a man without an ability to form a family since he doesn't have a household. He is a man who cannot work to sustain himself or any dependents. He is a man who can't even fulfill the civic and religious obligations. He is outside of all community. And from the sideline of everything, he has the audacity to shout to Jesus, heal me. He has the audacity from the outside position, no right to say anything, to shout to the Lord, to throw off his cloak and demand a healing. Bartimaeus throws off that cloak, and when he does, he leaves behind the only thing of value he owns. He casts aside his coat. He gets up quickly and abruptly runs to Jesus. That cloak is not just a garment. It is everything. It is what protects him from the elements. It's what makes it possible for him to sleep at night. It is how he collects the money he begs for. It is everything. He casts aside everything for the unknown. It is the tiniest bit of power that he has in this life, and he will cast it aside for Jesus. When Jesus asks him the question, Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? He answers he wants to see. And, and at once, Bartimaeus acknowledges who Jesus truly is because of what he's capable of doing. For believing in Jesus, he is rewarded with not only mercy but sight. And most importantly, what he chooses to do with the healing. He gets up and he follows Jesus. Here is where the body and the mind and the soul are shown as obviously integrated. Sight and understanding and salvation have joined together to form this healed body. And when we get to the end of this account with Bartimaeus, where the, the person is healed, where the crowd witnesses, usually the crowd just is like praise and thanksgiving. You see some of those, sometimes Jesus will say, don't tell anybody. Instead, we're only told here in Mark's gospel that immediately he regained his sight and he followed Jesus on the way. On the way to where? The Palm Sunday Road. He walks all that way to the Mount of Olives and the Palm Sunday Road, the road to Jerusalem, the doorway to Jerusalem that will begin a chain of events that will end at the cross. Bartimaeus truly exemplifies this body healed. He is a disciple who sees where the way ahead is leading. And he follows anyway. And he believes anyway. He goes anyway. When we get to the traditional Palm Sunday story, it's like Bartimaeus' story starts over again. Here we are on a roadway and there's someone on the sides and they begin to shout and they throw down their cloaks. Jesus is among a crowd again. This time, the cloak on the back of a young colt and blanketing the pathway from one mount to the next. They wave their palms so they can be seen. This time, it's not a singular voice on a dry desert road, but this time it is a chorus and it reverberates, Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. It is glory and it is pageantry. And this so-called triumphal entry is not really triumphant at all. If this were the king, when he got to the other end, surely there would be a coronation, right? A party of some kind? 
There would be a, a grand ritual where he would be seated. He would become the one who is the ruler, right? There's not even a banquet. There's not even a water station. None of that happens. None of those who were on the road who had the opportunity at healing follow. Instead, Jesus looks around the temple, and it's late, and he and the twelve leave, and none follow. There is so much healing to be done. There is so much healing to be done along that road. But alas, it will have to wait because it will happen at the cross. See, Jesus' ministry, even in his final days, was to help this perishable body to prepare it for imperishability, for the coming reign of God made real in Jesus. And he initiates here on the road this healed body. What a disciple who was healed will look like. How they will follow Jesus and compares it to the ones who won't. There are moments in our own faith life that we realize that our body is expressing our being in ways that reflect our spiritual condition. Sometimes our emotions reflect the way our body is expressing being human too with grief. It's because of our integrated nature, body, mind, and soul. Bartimaeus, just like the crowds, shouts from the street. Bartimaeus, just like the crowds, lays down his cloak. Bartimaeus, just like the crowds, listens for Jesus and wants to be seen. But what they see is different. And how they react to it is different. Bartimaeus sees the body of God, the body of God. Richard Rohr is a Franciscan priest, and he has helped remind us of something that we lost understanding about the body of God. When we talk about Jesus the Christ, we think of like Jesus is his first name and Christ is like his last name, his surname. The idea of Christ is so much older. Long before Jesus of Nazareth was born, the people longed for one to save, a Messiah. And in Jesus, the formless God takes on human being form. In Jesus, it becomes so much easier to love God in a tangible way. Christ means the anointed one, the body of God. God made flesh in the word. And Jesus walks this road embodying God's own love, incarnate with the Spirit, a presence with whom we can fall in love with. If we take discipleship seriously, if we get up and take heart and follow him, if we follow Jesus, we can fall in love with the elements of the body of God. It happens minute by minute, sometimes day by day, season by season, or decade by decade. If we take discipleship seriously, that is, following Jesus along this road, then all of us become infused with the divine, healed mercifully. This is what's radical about following him. This is what is life-altering about following Jesus. It should change everything about our lives when we understand we're body and mind and soul wrapped up in one who embodies all our needs. It should change the way we see ourselves and what salvation is or how we see one another, even the ones we don't like. It should change the way we see the stranger and the friend. The way we see our whole world, all of creation, should be changed. 
The crowds may act the same, but they do not see the body of God. What they see is something different. They see the kingdom. They think of the earthly kingdom. They see someone who perhaps will be a leader that they can influence, maybe even alter their decisions or control the outcome, or maybe help us out of our condition. You cannot manipulate God. That's failed discipleship. Today's scripture serves both as a blessing and a warning that we are at risk of being seen by Jesus but not experiencing his transformational healing and instead trying to handle it all ourselves. So I invite you to see this healed body because the greatest healing of all is to be reunited with the one who made you, to find reconciliation of being a human being with God. When that happens, often physical healing occurs. Even more often, mental and emotional balance is restored from that which has been topsy-turvy for so long. When you are one with God, your spirit is is enhanced and your relationships resulting from that become extraordinary. For the Christian, the basic purpose of spiritual healing is to renew and strengthen your relationship with the one living Christ. So my dear ones, whatever is not reconciled to God in your life, Here, what do you want me to do for you? For whatever brokenness that you have not trusted into your master's capable hands, whatever you have worked tirelessly to conceal, whatever growth you still need, whatever imbalance has caused you to fall and stumble, Hear him say to you, what do you want me to do for you? And give it to Jesus. Whatever celebration you need shouted from the rooftops, whoever you need to join you as you wave the palms so that Jesus can see you celebrating, whatever gift you have laid down for others and God, whatever uh, in your life blessing you have experienced, whatever victory that you need to claim, hear him say to you, what do you want me to do for you? And give it to Jesus. In a moment as we sing the song of invitation, I invite you to listen for his voice. To come and kneel and pray. To be anointed with oil. To ask for healing. To tell God what it is that you need. Come confessing if you must. Come to join the people of God at more first. As we follow Jesus along the way. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we offer ourselves up to you again in praise and thanksgiving. And ask that you would give us ears to hear you, that we might respond in earnest with our deepest need. Help us to sing with passion and compassion as we pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is Hosanna, loud Hosanna, let us stand as we sing. <clears throat>
As we come to a time of pastoral prayer, you're invited to share how we can pray with you. Those prayer cards are in the blue binders in the pew where you are. If you're online, you can direct message us. We'd be honored to pray over your needs and concerns. The staff prays over them on Mondays. We share them in our prayer list on Tuesdays. So if you want it to be confidential, just mark that on there. And just a few I'd like to share with you. If you would please continue to hold Jerry and Elaine Pryor after his surgery. Both of them got sick and they're really struggling. So they would really appreciate you to pray for their health. John Estep in his cancer treatment and Ruth and her support of him. Would you please hold them in prayer? Their health is really difficult right now. We are so glad to let you know that Elmer Percival is out of the hospital, but if you will continue to pray for his body's healing. Um, and our, one of our staff mem members, Amanda Pierce, she works in our PDO, is undergoing cancer treatment right now. Would you pray for her support as she desires to work and mother and wife and do all of the things in her life that bring her joy? And we also ask that you would pray for Terry Whittakin. He had a surgery and is recovering. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God of grace and God of glory, we praise you, we celebrate you for the healing that you have already begun because long before we knew to ask, you were already at work. And yet today we hear you say again, what do you want me to do for you? As your congregation of people at Morehurst, we pray for those you have given us the gift to pray for. We've named some out loud, but now we name others in our hearts before you. For we know, God, that your goodness and purpose for everyone is to find ourselves being perfected in your great love. And as we heal as human beings toward that grace, um, it is prayer that connects us to one another. We pray, O oh God, for the leaders of our community and the leaders of this city and the leaders of our state and country as they make decisions which impact all of us. We ask for wisdom to bless them. We also ask today, Lord, that you would hear our, our grief and our sorrow, our joy and our hope, that all of human emotion reflects part of your harmony of goodness in our lives. Your hands are big enough to hold all of these things as we offer them to you. We pray now, knowing that all things are not healed. They are not whole. And yet, Jesus, you promise it will be so. Until then, we will be united in our voice, united in our belief of that healing, as we pray that prayer which you taught us, Jesus, when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As the ushers prepare to receive God's tithes and our offerings this morning, I want to let you know that our Umquara mission team is home. They made it home last night, and um, they have talked about having a really great trip. I'm looking forward to hearing the stories um, that our missioners had this morning. <laughs> this morning when I pulled into the parking lot, I had a little bit of a freak out because there were, should have been two vans there. But there was only one van, so I made my way promptly inside to where Larry Johnson, one of the missioners, um, and one of our custodians was in here and said, oh, the other van's parked down there. I still have to gas it up and get it together. <sighs> Glad that, you know, because you think about uh, the, really the privilege of having the gift of vans. To be able to take our missioners to Louisiana, they take our kids to camp, they take our kids to retreat, uh, they carry, we have seniors on the go. I'm going to steal a joke, Pastor Shannon. Look, without the van, seniors on the go are just seniors. <laughs> Vans are critical, you know, but we make sure that it has fuel and tires, that it's maintenance, and that um, we have insurance and all those things. And all of that comes from the funds when you return your tithes to God. It's just a part of being privileged in ministry to have resources like two really nice vans. So thank you 
for the ways that you give because those ordinary dollars that you put in help us actually go out in the world and do extraordinary things and care well for one another. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we return our tithes to you and share our offerings that we might bless you. You've given us everything. It's yours already. But out of a lo- act of love and, and connection, we return these to you and pray that we would be good stewards of all this life that you give us as we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.
Special thanks in worship today. Dr. Lacey Phelps was able to join us and also our guest accompanist, Neil White. Please take a moment to give thanks for their work. As we prepare to leave this place, there are lots of ways in this holy week that you can gather together uh, to be the family of faith, to walk this journey. I hope you'll come on Wednesday night for regular dinner. Lots of musicians will be here planning and preparing for Easter worship. Um, in addition, on Thursday night, I'd like to invite you to join us at 6 p.m. in the Christian Living Center for our Maundy Thursday worship where we will remember the Seder dinner in the upper room, where we will gather together to actually eat dinner together and conclude that evening with Holy Communion. What happens that night in the upper room is such an integral part of walking this journey. I'd like to invite you to join us again for worship here in this room at 6.30 on Friday night for Good Friday service. It is the remembrance of the crucifixion. It is a service of darkness and an extraordinary opportunity to live in the depth of that gift that Jesus gives us. It is until Easter morning when the sun breaks dawn that we live in the grief of that, but at that moment when the sun breaks the horizon and death is defeated, I hope you'll join us for Easter worship here, 815, 1045, both here in the sanctuary and in the Christian Living Center. We're having a potluck brunch during the Sunday school hour. All Sunday schools are canceled for all ages and a bunny hop trunk or treat on the street, on Main Street, for those who have little ones. There's a rain plan, so don't worry about that. I hope you will walk this journey this week, experiencing the highs and the lows of what it is to live a life with Jesus. And may you go forth from this place today to follow in his footsteps with the power of the Holy Spirit welling up and overflowing from you to guide your way. That we may honor God with our life and breath and movement and being. And until we gather again, may you know God's peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.